Well, hello everyone. My name is Sarah Pinkham and I'm the Exhibition and Engagement Coordinator for the Main Library Gallery at the University of Iowa Libraries. Just wanna thank you for joining us today to learn about the Spring 2024 Gallery Exhibit, Making the Book, Past and Present, which was curated by Eric Ensley and Emily Martin. For those who haven't had a chance to visit, the Main Library Gallery is located on the first floor of the Main Library here at Iowa. Our, exhi our exhibit team produces a new exhibit each semester for which guest curators from across campus are selected to use storytelling and our archives and materials at the UI libraries to share an area of, our of their expertise with our community. Making the book past and present will close in the gallery on June 28th, but you can also check out the virtual tour, which is coming soon. And today's talk is presented by co-curators Eric and Emily, and they will give you a behind the scenes look at their exhibit for which they selected a truly beautiful array of books. Dr. Eric Ensley is the curator of rare books and maps in special collections and archives at the University of Iowa Libraries. He is a medievalist and book historian by training and holds a PhD in English from Yale University and a master's degree in library science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. The concept for this exhibit was first explored by Eric during a class he developed and has taught for many years, both at Yale and at Iowa. Emily Martin is a book artist and adjunct assistant professor of book binding and book arts the University of Iowa Center for the Book. She hold in, holds an MFA in painting from the University of Iowa and has self-published limited editions of her own movable and sculptural artist books for nearly 30 years. Her works are part of both public and private collections throughout the U.S. and internationally. It has sincerely been a pleasure working with both Eric and Emily on this exhibit, and both of them have brought their vital expertise and skills to this project, so thank you both for your very hard work. And the curators will have time for some questions through Zoom's Q&A function after their talk. So please feel free to put things into the Q&A and we'll address those afterward. Uh, and their contact information will also be available. So please welcome Eric and Emily. All right, thank you. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, I just also wanted to say thank you to Sarah for all the incredible work she's done in the gallery for both this exhibition and all the other exhibitions that come through every six months. She's one of the hardest working people in our libraries, and I think it shows in how well uh, everything came together and how great it looks down there to, uh, today. Um, and I also wanted to say thank you to all of our collaborators who helped put this exhibition together. Uh, for anybody who's ever worked in exhibitions, you know that doing this kind of work involves an entire uh, city's worth of people. Uh, it's not just Emily and I, but also con conservation staff, it's exhibition staff, it's digital people, it's um, basically members of the library in our community. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, Emily, is there anything you'd like to say before we get going? No, I just very much echo what you just said, that it was definitely not the two of us alone getting getting this going. Okay, so without further ado, uh, we will talk a little bit about our exhibition, which is called Making the Book Past and Present. Uh, but we have uh, cheerfully called this Judging Books by Covers, uh, which we're kind of encouraging for the next hour at the very least. Okay, so we wanted to start with the idea behind this exhibition. Uh, and as Sarah hinted at it in our introductions, this is an exhibition that has been many, many years in the making. In terms of the preparation and planning for it on the ground, it's been two and a half to three years worth of planning here at the University of Iowa. It takes quite a bit of time to go through all the labor that puts something uh, into a gallery like this. But the legs of this extend further. Um, about seven years ago now, that's many years, I uh, began teaching a class at Yale called What is a Book? And it was a class that was encouraging young students to look at special collections through the Beinecke Library, look at books and think about how they uh, funnel and change the way we think about the world. Uh, so books and their covers do matter and the page layouts and designs and letter shapes and things like that. And in this classroom, uh, we brought out medieval manuscripts, we brought out uh, early modern works, but alongside them, I like to bring out modern artworks uh, that really showcase what's being done today in bookmaking and showing that it's something that has not died away. It's something that's very actively being done by artists all over the world. And among those works was Emily's uh, books and the Beinecke Library at Yale. Uh, as many of you know, her work is uh, found in uh, libraries and museums across the world. 
And bringing these books into conversation with these medieval manuscripts and antiquarian books, I remembered that these classes were always some of the most lively. The students really engaged in Emily's with Emily's work that often looks at books from the past and brings them to life in new ways and through new lenses. Uh, so when I got to Yale about three and a half years ago, I knew Emily was working here and has her studio here. And I immediately reached out and wanted to work with her to help put together uh, this exhibition. So taking what we did in the classroom and making it writ large. Um, Emily, is there anything you'd like to add to that? <laughs> no, what I would like, yeah, there is, I have plenty to add to this. Um, when when Eric first got to Iowa, I, I was I was pretty delighted to be able to talk to him in person. And I, I was also delighted to realize that he was quite familiar with my books. And, and we started conversations that I think are very much reflected in how this exhibit turned out. You know, we, we both had kind of lots of things to say about how we wanted, what things we wanted to include. And, and uh, so it's been a really enjoyable uh, back and forth all this time pulling it off. Yeah, I agree with that. And one of the challenges with making an exhibition like this, uh, making the book past and present, is that a lot of exhibitions that appear in this beautiful gallery space often have narratives to them, told through archival sources, uh, the lives of people who are associated with Iowa or communities. And one of the challenges when we talk about this sort of making of the book is what is our narrative? And it was something Emily and I worked together to come up with. And it ended up being a sort of, uh, it's a conversation. So it's the life cycle of books from their beginnings uh, to their ends, uh, which we'll get to at the end of the talk. And I think something that we wanted to bring out is that when we put old books in conversation with new books, it's not always a conversation that doveta dovetails nicely. Um, some books will, from the past, will influence modern artists, but sometimes there's going to be challenges and things that uh, we find ethically challenging and conversations that are difficult. And I think that's another thing that we wanted to bring out, that there's a kind of tensions and positives and dovetails and all sorts of things that happen when we put these books in conversation. So coming to why the University of Iowa, why do this here and why now? Well, uh, I think one of the things about Iowa that's really amazing and that I learned when I got here is how rich our community is and how much it is structured around books. Um, some of you in the audience will know that Iowa City is a UNESCO city of literature, and we have a yearly book celebration that draws quite a crowd and, you know, famous for the Iowa Writers Workshop, but there's more to it than that. We also have a really wonderful community of bookmakers here, here through the University of Iowa Center for the Book. Uh, it's one of the few uh, last degree granting, uh, graduate degree granting institutions of bookmaking in the country. Alongside that, we also have a community of book historians on campus. Um, I will go out on a limb and say we have one of the richest and strongest communities of book historians in any university in the country, um, from Beth Yale working in early modern work, Kendra Strand working in East Asian, uh, Paul Dilley in early, and there are many, many others who I won't uh, belabor the point. Um, and then finally, alongside that, we have an incredible library and incredible special collections. Uh, one of the richest special collections I've seen and one that we are happy to make available to our community and goes towards uh, encouraging people to look at these works, uh, interact with them and inspire future artists, future researchers. So we wanted to bring together those two strands and really celebrate the University of Iowa community and everything that we do on campus and the people who come out of here. Uh, so people who have gone on to do great things, make art and become researchers in themselves. Okay, so next question was, how do we want to engage with, who, whom do we want to engage with this exhibition? Um, I wanted to start from the very beginning and say that I'm a book nerd. I love old books. Emily, I know you love books too. <laughs> um, I imagine that many of you in the audience will as well. But we wanted people, students, undergraduates, people from the community who have maybe not considered the history of the book as an object to come in and think about the possibilities of it uh, as art today, as things from the past and ways to connect with people from the past. And um, thinking about this structure and how it moves through time. So we really wanted something that would speak to people who maybe don't have that knowledge, but then also bring out items that would be exciting for people who are maybe 
book nerds like us who uh, have not seen some of these items from our collection and that may uh, would encourage them to come see uh, these these things in the future. Okay, so turning towards the arrangement of the exhibition, I wish that you all could be in the gallery and if you are able to get there, I would really encourage you to come see this exhibition. Uh, Call Me Is Strong and the conservation team did a really wonderful job of helping make this design beautiful. It's an elegant, really professional looking exhibition. Uh, but we can't cover everything in this short talk, uh, so we are going to focus in on a few things, but I wanted to give the overview of what this exhibition would look like. We are looking towards uh, the left-hand wall as you walk into the exhibition, and on the left-hand side, we arrange things to be about substrates on the left, and what we mean by that are things you put your book on and things you put your book in. So that might be paper, parchment, or bindings, and then I'm going to advance the slide here. In the left-hand picture, we're now looking towards the right-hand wall as you walk in. And that one, we wanted to look at design work and think about how the page is structured and how that changes meanings and how we interact with pages and encourage us, uh, encourage us to share information in different ways. And then along the back here, you can see the printed by type. We included a case on uh, printing by type, which is a technology that appears in the early modern period in Western Europe. But we also wanted to include a new work that uh, Emily will talk about soon. And then um, along the back wall, we included six of these smaller cases. And these cases are kind of experimental or focal points in the exhibition. These are places that we wanted to have conversations between new and old and ones, uh, items that we thought spoke to each other or uh, spoke to the past and present in interesting ways. So as I said, we can't cover all of these, but we would love for you to come and see all of them. But I think Emily are and I are going to focus in on a couple of things that we found particularly exciting. Uh, Emily, anything you wanna add before we get going? No, nope. you can carry on, Eric. All right. <laughs> so let's jump over to that left-hand wall. And this is where we, when we're giving in-person tours, we often begin with students or any group of people who come in. And I like to start with parchment. Um, I'm showing my medievalist bona fides here where uh, I'm a parchment lover. And for those of you who don't know, uh, parchment is actually animal skin that has been treated in a special way. And it was the substrate of choice for the Middle Ages in Western Europe. Uh, was not the case in, in East Asia or other places, but we wanted to begin here with Western Europe because this is a case that's going to grab people as they walk in. Uh, as you look towards the bottom of that case, um, I think you're gonna be drawn into that medieval manuscript that's sitting there. And we'll talk about that one in just a moment. Uh, why is why am I fond of these materials? I think I just uh, I love that people are still working with parchment today, and more on them in just a second as well. But it's also something that uh, feels a little foreign to people who have not handled these sorts of books before. It's not common to find animal skin books anymore, and considering the heavy expense that goes into these items, both in terms of the materials as a monetary value, but also the value of literally sacrificing lives of animals in order to create these kinds of books, I think is an interesting thought uh, for students who have not encountered this before. So talking through what's in this case, uh, at the bottom you see that there is a Psalter from the Middle Ages, and I have a picture of that I'll zoom in on in a second. On the left-hand side, we'll have a, a little uh, artist book, a uh, girdle book that Emily will talk about in a few minutes here. And along the back wall, we have two pieces created by Madison Bennett, and I will talk about Madison again in just a moment as well. So we have an antiquarian piece, the medieval piece in the bottom right, and then three pieces that were made within the last few years. I'm going to advance the slide. So I usually begin with the Psalter, and I am very fond of this. This is a 14th, a 15th century Psalter, excuse me. So we're talking from the 1400s. And the thing that immediately draws people in when they see this object is the gigantic bee on the page that is designed by hand. Everything on this book is handwritten by a medieval scribe. And I think that's the thing that most people consider and are kind of ooh and awe over when they first see it. But getting to the point of our exhibition, if we look to the right-hand side of this, 
you note that there's a kind of newer piece of parchment there. And that was actually a repair that was done uh, back in the 1980s by our first university conservator here at the University of Iowa. His name was William Anthony, Bill Anthony. And he's very well known in the bookbinding community for being one of the great master binders of the, uh, of the 20th century. Um, he's, he's no longer with us, but his work is still with us. And it's really quite amazing. He also rebound this entire Psalter. It was pretty damaged, um, as you can see uh, from this repair that was done on this page. And I think what's so wonderful about this is that even with this 15th century book, it's showing the work of bookmakers and bookbinders and people who are still working with these materials and how they have a huge role to play in making sure that these books remain stable for us today and in the future. And also how that work is taking place right here on campus in front of our own eyes. And I'm going to jump ahead here. And speaking to that, um, this is a piece along the back of this case called Sheepskin Palimpsest. And this is an absolutely stunning piece by Madison Bennett, who I believe I saw is in the audience today. Uh, hi, Madison. And Madison is both an artist and a parchment maker. And she, when she was here at the University of Iowa, made her own parchment in which she did the calligraphy to make this art piece during uh, the pandemic, uh, sort of an automatic writing piece and considering the use of books and bodies and erasures and uh, the work that goes into making uh, this parchment. And on the right hand, she kindly donated these samples from her time at the last parchment maker in the United States, uh, which is called Pergamena. Pergamena is in upstate New York and still is making traditional styles of parchment. And she, these are in four different kinds of animals here. So, uh, part, and one of the exciting things about Madison, she was a student at the Center for the Book here, and she has gone on to do her graduate studies at Cambridge, where she is studying um, the, the uh, substrate of parchment from uh, Paris in the 13th and 14th century, a very specific kind of parchment. So this interconnectedness of making and uh, the study of book history is alive and well, and I think on display in this case. And I'll turn this one over to Emily. Okay, and while Madison was a student here at the Center for the Book, she studied calligraphy with Cheryl Jacobson, and uh, who is just an extraordinary calligrapher and has taught at the center for many years. And this particular book is a girdle book, which is a historic structure. And it's a collaborative project between Cheryl and um, Kristen Baum, who was the assistant conservator uh, at the time that they were making this book. Bill Anthony had been succeeded by um, Pam Spitzmuller and um, Gary Frost. And then Kristen was here working with Gary Frost. And she and Cheryl made this, this collaborative book, uh, combining to do the content of the pages, but the calligraphy is by Cheryl and the, the girdle book binding is by Kristen. And a girdle book is a personal book. It's, um, it's a medieval structure, and the knob that you can see at the bottom is um, called the Turk's Knot often, and it slips under the belt of a person, which is sometimes called a girdle, and holds the book to the body of the person who owns it, and it can be referred to um, easily. And so they were almost always personal documents, books of hours. They might be um, herbal recipes or um things of that sort. And so it's really, really lovely to have this example of, of a historic form in modern use. And, um, and we, it was one of the ones that we especially wanted to include in the exhibit. And I'm going to talk again about um, paper. Paper has always been um, kind of paramount here at, at Iowa at the, as a part of the Center for the Book. When Kim Merker was um, first trying to really get the idea of the Center for the Book off the ground, he convinced um, the dean, Spriesterbach at the time, to hire uh, both Bill Anthony as conservator at the library and to bring Tim Barrett here as the papermaker in residence with a research facility out at the Oakdale campus. And so that was in the late 80s. And so that's the sort of um, start of the, the 
the center existed in in some form or another before that, but that was when it really got the ball rolling. And so Tim came and um, was uh, teaching paper making in the art school and also through his lab. And so what we see on the left there is a screen with a decal, and that's you. Paper is made from fibers in a in a water slurry, and it is captured onto a screen. Um, which is called a mold and decal. And the decal is the frame, which is removed so that you can then remove the piece of paper onto uh, a felt to dry it. And so it's um, it's a very physical process um, and you s- use different kinds of fiber. And so Tim was um, doing a lot of research into different kinds of fiber. He lived in Japan uh, during a Fulbright and has is really a, just an extraordinary researcher and a recipient of a MacArthur Award. And so we've been incredibly lucky to have him here during his, his time uh, at the university. And so the sheet of paper in the back, we believe is one that was actually pulled by Tim and uh, using the mold that you can see. And uh, the screening allows the water to drain away. And uh, it's a wonderful process um, and kind of difficult to understand if you haven't seen it. But um, but we continue to have paper makers here uh, as students and we have a new um, instructor and we'll talk about him later. Um, and then uh, that brings me to this slide that Eric is gonna talk about. So this is another medieval manuscript we have in this uh, long case along the far wall. And this is certainly not the most beautiful manuscript in our collection, but it might be my favorite. And this one is from the 14th century, likely. And it's a uh, kind of a ratty looking book. It's wrapped in an old piece of parchment that was used for a document at one point that was, uh, it's kind of a medieval trapper keeper in some ways. And that's a really apt designation because this was very likely a university text uh, for a student. And if you begin to look closely at this, you realize that this is on Western, uh, it's on uh, early medieval paper. Uh, Paper doesn't enter into uh, Western Europe until 13th century um, and doesn't become popular until the 14th or 15th century. So this is a really early example. It's cheap. And the student is using it to uh, basically make a cheap book for a university setting. You can see the doodle popping up at the bottom left of the page there. And I love to show this to students because it really uh, shows them that students have not changed all that much in the couple in the thousand years between them. And if we get to the back of it, we even get the uh, scribe writing his name at the end of it as well. So it's nice to have this early example of paper in in the exhibit uh, to show to students. And then I'll just add in, we also did not want to show just Western European paper. As Emily said, we have a really strong tradition here of, ma- of uh, making East Asian style papers. Um, and we wanted to display the different kinds that were available to people throughout the world. Uh, we have this really lovely example of Arab paper on the left. And you can even see in the photos that there's a glossiness to it. The light catches off the page and reflects. And that is because Arab paper, though made with flax, which uh, high com- high flax component, which gives it this brown color, is often heavily sized and polished. So it's covered with a coating, a kind of waxy coating of some sort. You can use different things for sizing, uh, but then polished down because Arab scribes preferred to have that slick page to write on, and also that the glossiness was seen as aesthetically pleasing. And on the right hand, with this uh, Waka poetry, which is on a really beautiful paper from Tim Barrett's collection he donated to uh, our library, you can see that this piece actually has pieces of silver and gold embedded in the paper. So we call those inclusions. And this was uh, not super common, but it was often used with poetry in East Asian settings uh, to decorate the page. It was believed that the paper should be as beautiful as the poetry that was being put onto it. So thinking of material and text going together here. And I'll turn it over to Emily to talk about this really exciting part of our exhibition. Yeah, so this, what you're seeing here are very large sheets of paper that were made by um, visiting Japanese paper makers that were here at the University of Iowa in the spring of 2023. And our current paper maker is a 
fellow named Nick Cladis, who also spent uh, seven years living in Japan studying papermaking. And through his connections, he was able to bring these two papermakers to work here, making sheets of paper with the students. And so a lot of these are seven, eight feet long, and they are around the upper levels of the gallery space and a really just a dynamic addition to the to the exhibit. And it's it's uh, difficult to grasp their scale in, in these slides, but there's a lot of different techniques. They were working with the students. They were here uh, for an extended period. And, and it was a very exciting time to have, um, have them working here. And it also, it, again, serves to expand the range of, um, of paper making that that goes on amongst our students. And in the same, where the slide on the left that says paper as art shows the different sheets, but I also want to point out on the upper uh, le layer, the uh, the two with the right are pieces that are done by Nick Cladis um, that are in the gallery as well. And uh, so he, he makes paper as art uh, as part of his practice, as well as teaching. And uh, it, it's just um, fabulous to be able to start building this collection of Asian papers at the library. And so all of these are now, and many more, are now a part of the, um, of the growing collection here. Eric? Yes. So I'm seeing a question in the chat from Beth Cox, uh, which is a really good one. She uh, says, when I think of glossy paper, it can be difficult to write on with contemporary pens without it rubbing off. Was Arab paper difficult for them to write on? So of course, being a scribe of, of Arab calligraphy uh, took a lot of practice. So they were practiced at not smudging the ink as they moved through it. And then I think the other part of it is that they were using a different kind of pen than uh, even Western Europeans would use. If we think of the image of a Western medieval scribe with a little quill pen from a goose, uh, that's accurate. Uh, but in Arab settings, they used a thing called a kalam. And a kalam is a reed that would allow ink to flow down it into a nib. And it was designed to be able to write somewhat more quickly and fluidly because Arab is a naturally cursive script. So they wanted something that would glide a little bit more and not catch in the same way as you might experience on parchment or uh, with a goose pen. So thank you for that question. All right. I'm, we are going to change gears a little bit here. And we've talked a little bit about materials and substrates. And we're going to jump to talking about some of the cases that we really enjoyed putting together or thinking about. And uh, for one of mine, I wanted to talk about these two pieces along the back wall. Um, these are really two treasures from our collection. I'm fond of them very much. And the top two pieces are from a piece called a Humament. So this is uh, one of the great treasures of our collection. It was received as part of the Marvin, Sack Marvin and Ruth Sackner uh, collection that was donat uh, donated to Iowa a few years ago. And we are just uh, making that available to people in the last uh, few years and are very proud of it. And this piece uh, is by Tom Phillips, who sadly passed away last year. Uh, he was a British-born artist and worked in erasures and blackout poetry. He's one of the first innovators of blackout poetry and is kind of considered a master of the genre. And this is from uh, the original A Humament, which is one of the masterpieces of blackout poetry. And the story of that is that he went down to a corner store in London, picked up a Victorian novel from, from the bookstore, called it, it was called a, um, a Human Document. And he was so taken with the title that he decided that was going to be the subject of this piece that he spent decades writing and rewriting and turned it into a sort of re-envisioning of the human through this piece. Uh, you can see that the blackout poetry, where the page is blacked out to make uh, a new text, and he did make a complete narrative uh, with different characters from, uh, from this novel, and then uh, rewrote images on the back that spoke to what he was discussing on the page. So in this way, Tom Phillips was really re-envisioning what the page could do. He was taking a text, writing over it, and thinking through what words can be rearranged to make new meanings and think about different topics that maybe the original novel didn't. And then alongside that on the bottom, we have this incredible piece uh, by a, a ninth century monk named Rabanus Morris. 
Rabanus Morris uh, is one of the innovators of uh, sort of visual devotional theology in the Middle Ages. It, this is quite early. And what he does is takes this thing that looks like a crossword puzzle to us. So this is actually um, a string of letters and then superimposes an image of Christ on it. And then there are, if we begin to look closely, we will realize that there are Latin words on the body of Christ. So the idea was beh behind this was that a person who was looking at this book would look at the body of Christ, think on it through prayer, and then would focus in on these words. So the words would be caught on your eye. If we look in closely, um, you can see the word verbum, perhaps, uh, which means the word. So if you think of the Bible, the word is God. Uh, that's why that's at the center of his chest. And if we come down to the line below that, virtus, so virtue, Christ is full of virtue. And why this case excites me so much is we have people who are 1,200 years apart, but in some ways they are having a similar conversation. They are thinking of the page as a string of letters from which we can pull meaning and focus our eyes in different ways so that it moves through the page in ways that we maybe didn't expect. And this is kind of the idea that's excited me behind this show. Um, I don't think Tom Phillips perhaps thought about being in conversation with Urbanus Morris, and Urbanus Morris certainly couldn't have foretold the, the humament. But in some ways, they're talking about similar things. And I think putting these uh, side by side is a really exciting prospect. And this one we have on display is from 1503. It's a very early printing of Morris Rubanus. Uh, so this was originally in medieval manuscripts and then was quickly translated into print so that people could continue in this uh, sort of mode of visual theology and devotion. And then this this particular case was one that that I I very much wanted to um, figure out some kind of combination. This these are uh, four different vovels, which are wheels that turn and are used in a variety of ways. And the 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 historic one, um, which I'm going to only say in English, the new questions of the sphere um, is from 1564. So this again is. Um, uh, movables of this sort are uh, were being put in books from pretty much the moment that books started being made. The the first known wheels and flaps um, were done in the 13th century by a monk named Matthew Paris in England, and he was making these wheels to facilitate the calculation of religious holidays into the future. And so the the basic premise is that the um, there's a base sheet that stays stationary and then there's a wheel or multiple wheels that turn to allow different configurations. And so we have the historic model and then three contemporary uh, or modern um, interpretations by different artists. The lowest one there is um, Ellen Knudsen subject object verb, and you can turn on uh, four different wheels to make a variety of combinations. And then the upper left is Lunar Vauvel by Monica Ong. And the one on the right, the face is, um, that's Lady Bracknell from The Importance of Being Earnest, which is uh, my treatment of uh, Oscar Wilde's plays and um, essays so that the mouth, as the wheel turns, the the character is able to speak their lines. And so it, um, I think a lot of times people don't remember or know that these structures, which they may only be familiar with in children's books or, or um, informational vovels, have been around for a very, very long time and are kind of endlessly useful in the ways that, uh, that they can be um, put to different kinds of information. And so this is the other early type of movable. This is a book by uh, Casey Gardner called Body of Inquiry. And it directly references uh, historical uh, anatomical lift flap books of which here at the Hardin Medical Library, we have a lovely collection of the historic examples. And so they were used for medical students to actually study anatomy. And in this case, um, Casey is is sort of exploring the anatomy of uh, in a different way and with different content, but it's it's a similar function that you kind of excavate into, uh, as she says, the opening to a corporal codex. And this is 
uh, from 2011. And it's, uh, it's just a lovely example of a sort of modern take of a historical book flap, but book form. And then this, um, you know, uh, printing is no longer done from raised type, but it uh, starting um, in China, the first known movable type was made with clay in, they think, the 10th century. There's a lot of debate about various ages of these things. And then Korea was where, um, in the 13th century, was the first development of metal type to print from. And, and that continued to be uh, expanded to Europe and Gutenberg, um, who's pretty well known, um, but he was not the first, um, first in Europe. But uh, type was uh, raised type in reverse, um, was locked up in a press frame and inked, and then paper is rolled over it and the impression is taken. And this particular image that I, I wanted to include here. This is um, from a combination, a set of prints uh, called The City is My Religion by Jen Farrell who, of Starshape Press, who's in Chicago. And she was studying um, various archives at the uh, Newberry Library and has this style of um, combining all kinds of ornaments and type uh, locked up, raised type, locked up on a press bed to print her images. And so as the uh, raised type movable pieces became out of the common industry, it was replaced by digital printing, artists started getting their hands on all of these things. And so she has an extraordinary collection of ornaments and type. And so you can see the, the raised type on the right um, and you can sh see the intricacy of all those different pieces of ornament that she has figured out this layout to make this architectural image on the left. And each color that you see in that print is from a separate run through the press. So it's built up, this image is built up in, in a series of layers. And it's just an extraordinary uh, set of prints that she made for this. And we're very lucky to have that here at uh, at the libraries. So when we do the tours, um, especially with students, I like to end with a couple of cases that we're going to end with you uh, today with. And one of those is against the wall. Uh, we have a set of what are called altered books. And altered books are when you take a book and you reuse it or repurpose it, as Emily Martin likes to say, uh, to make a new object, to make a new artistic object. And what happened with this one on the left, it's a piece uh, called The Spheres by Carlos Messia. Carlos Messia uh, was a artist in Miami, a book artist who makes altered books. And he took this piece of, uh, he took this book um, called uh, on the Spheres by Sacra Bosco. And this copy is from the 16th century, so from the 1500s. And he took it apart and repurposed it to make this artwork that makes a cosmography of the 1990s when he made it. Now, at first, I know some people will bristle at the idea that uh, he broke down this book to make this art. But at the same time, uh, th the book uh, on the spheres is a cosmography in itself. It's uh, treating the universe and what it means, uh, what is the Earth's place within the universe. Uh, so he's kind of playing with the idea of it. And this is an early printed book. So there are many, many copies of this book still floating around. So I like to end the tours with students with an ethical question of art. Uh, when is it okay? to uh, repurpose books for art and students will all have different answers and of course there's no completely correct answer to this question and it's a great place to end on with the students because it's something they'll take away and think about. I uh, find a lot of them have been, uh, it's appeared in the Daily Iowan here on the campus in the campus newspaper thinking about that and it's something that seems to register with them quite a bit. Um, so we wanted to treat the topic of how do books come to an end and what does that mean for us today. 
uh, in the case here on the right, we are able to talk a little bit about some of the research that's being done on the University of Iowa's campus. So I and a team of researchers here and library staff, uh, conservators, we worked uh, to with the radiology staff at the medical library to scan the components of the book on the right, which is a 16th century uh, bestiary or animal encyclopedia. And if you look at the spine, we're very fortunate in some ways that this the binding on this book is broken. It allows us to fold it back without damaging it. And along the spine, I said this book is from the 1500s, but the spine is reinforced with medieval fragments that are from around 1050 to 1100. This was a very common practice in the early modern period to shred medieval manuscripts that you didn't need anymore. Perhaps the text was updated, perhaps you couldn't even read it, and you would reinforce the binding structure. For medievalists today and early modernists and book historians, those spine uh, guards, as we call them, can often contain texts that we didn't know existed or very important to the history of books. So we like to be able to see them to figure out what texts are on them. So we used a CT scanner uh, to prove that this was a capability that we can do today. It was an article that was published just last year, and we actually appeared in the New York Times for this research um, in a really interesting little article about going to the hospital to look at old books. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. And I find this really grabs students who are interested in science. And we've paired it on the left with an art artist book um, by Raphael Rubenstein uh, called A Geniza. So for those of you not familiar, A Geniza, it is not allowed in the Jewish faith to uh, throw away any text that contains the name of God. Uh, so this means that you have to give it a proper burial and the proper place for that is called a Geniza. Uh, and why, where this uh, artist book is coming from is a very famous archeological find in the early 20th century called the Cairo Geniza. Um, so this goes back to the middle ages when Jewish people were throwing away their um, books into this, into this burial pit. And it became an archeological place to rediscover the life of Jewish people in Cairo going back to the middle ages. Uh, Rubenstein has used this as a idea um, to think through what it means to be a person today, thinking through living our day-to-day -day lives. And he's created this own Geniza, this box of archival matter that um, to make an artist book out of it. So we hope to show with these kind of three examples that there are different ways of thinking of books of coming to an end. And sometimes they come back to us with afterlives, which I think is rather exciting too. The end is not just the end. So we will end with that and this really beautiful book that is along the back wall called An Old Book, um, which was donated to us uh, through um, uh, the bookbinder, Jan Saboda, who passed away in the 2000s, but his wife, uh, Yarmila Saboda, um, who is still working today. So we hope to uh, see you in the gallery and we hope to be able to answer any questions you might have for us today. And thank you for joining us.